On today's episode of the Unveiled Podcast, I had the pleasure and privilege of sitting down with Bill Richards. William Richards, known as Bill, is author of Sacred Knowledge, Psychedelics and Religious Experiences. He is Director of Therapy at Sunstone Therapies, currently focused on psilocybin-assisted therapy in palliative care. He's also a psychologist at the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, where he and his colleagues have been pursuing research with psilocybin since 1999, and he teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies. As you might imagine, this conversation goes deep into Bill's experience and work in the area of, in particular, psilocybin research in therapeutic settings. Bill is really a forefather of this industry, one of the originators of everything that has come since 1999 with using psilocybin in studies for healing. This conversation digs into how Bill sees this industry evolving and where he's now focused, especially within palliative care. But we also do a deep dive into Bill's history and what he has observed, witnessed, and learned in the years that he has been involved in psilocybin and psychedelic research. This is a fascinating podcast discussion, especially if you're interested in the realm of how to use plant medicines for human healing and well-being. Bill is a very interesting character, and he's very specific about use of and the practical applications of psilocybin and psychedelic therapies. And we discuss all of that and more in today's Unveiled Podcast episode. Enjoy. I am honored today on the Unveiled podcast. I have an, a guest with an illustrious history of research and study and authorship and all the things. And I cannot wait for him to share with us some of his wisdom and education and thoughts. And I'm just delighted to welcome Dr. Bill Richards to the Unveiled podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's I look forward to our time together here. Yeah. Curious about where, what all we might cover. Right. And there's so much to cover. And so I was just uh, thinking before we started recording, we could start anywhere, but I really want to start at the beginning. So our listeners will have heard my introduction and know about your research in the realm of psilocybin. And I kind of want to understand, as one of the people who is in the original fields of all of this. Where did this begin for you? Why was this something that called to you? What's the impetus to get into this realm? Uh, well, let's see where we go. Uh, believe it or not, uh, once upon a time, I was a 23-year-old graduate student mm -hmm. at the University of Göttingen in Germany, uh, taking courses in both psychiatry and theology which you can do in the German university, as you may right. know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, around the corner from the dormitory where I was living was the Nerfin clinic, the nerve clinic or psychiatric clinic. Yeah. And there was a professor there, Hans Karl Leuner, who was looking for uh, volunteers to test some new drug that was supposed to evoke memories from early childhood. And I was writing down my dreams at that time, uh, stupidly going out without breakfast to write them down. I had to collect my phenomenological data, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was rather serious in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, but interested in consciousness in the mind, you know. Mm. And um, I went over to the clinic and asked if I could be a research participant. Two of my friends had participated, mm -hmm. and one experienced himself sitting in his father's lap, and his father had been killed in World War II, oh. and it was just incredibly healing and meaningful to mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. and the other reported what he called hallucinations of SS men, Schutzchattel, marching in the streets, and I thought, gee, I've never seen a hallucination before. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds interesting. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So, so I went over to the clinic and they asked me if I got drunk very often and <laughs> if I was in good health. And I, and then they led me to this little basement room with a narrow window looking out over the hospital garbage cans mm. and gave me an injection of this drug I had never heard of called psilocybin. Mm. And um, in way, in some ways, I could say the rest of my life has been footnotes to that day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I 
I was, I think what saved me in terms of supportive set and setting was uh, kind of my Methodist uh, pietistic background, mm. where I believe that if any terrible insights about my Oedipal complex came up, that God would be with me. So there was this <laughs> right. kind of act, there was kind of this orientation of mm -hmm. letting go, trusting, right. being open. Mm -hmm. um, and what opened up was this incredible, transcendental, eternal, magnificent form of consciousness mm -hmm. uh, that the Hindus would call moksha. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't even know that was possible. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And when the drug wore off, I remember I said, what was that drug you gave me? You know, how do you spell it? <laughs> right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was my uh, entry into this field. I was mm. just awestruck. Mm. And um, then I became a volunteer in the clinic, uh, uh, guiding English-speaking people through uh, psychedelic sessions while it mm -hmm. was still legal. Mm -hmm. And we discovered there, that, of course, the importance of supportive set and setting. Right. We started to use music and have someone with the person instead mm -hmm. of leaving them alone, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. And so, so just uh, just date this for us. So what, what year is this? Because everyone this knows, not, like, there's been... This is 1963. Yeah. Wait, which is... is that right? Yes, 1963. Yeah. Which is... You were right stuck in the mind of God, I bet. I, yeah, I'm, I'm an 86 baby, so I was well after this. And and yet my mum was, my mum's a 46 baby, so she was around at the time when this became something in the 60s um, in the UK. Uh -huh. But there's an interesting, you know, the people who know the, the psychedelic legalization, then it, banning and all that kind of story know that this is before the kind of late 60s, early 70s, when everything went differently. But I'm interested. So you mentioned this like religious upbringing. Was that the thing that got you into exploring the mind and consciousness to begin with as even a concept? Or was that from somewhere different? Well, it you know, as a Methodist child, you know, we valued religious experience. Right. John Wesley had his heart strangely warmed, you know, a little like the MDMA <laughs> heart chakra opening up, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing uh, uh, in terms of visionary or archetypal or what we now call mystical right. uh, phenomena. Okay. Uh, but an but an appreciation of the experiential dimension of religion. Got it. And, and I hope as the religious scholarship world wakes up to this frontier, that uh, mm -hmm. this will again come alive. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, religions of the world could use uh, a bit more of a experiential awareness of the sacred. That's an interesting as comment. I to creeds and. Uh, traditions you know? yeah yeah that's interesting I'm and I feel yeah. like oh my god there's so many directions we could go in I, I want to come back to that I'm going to put a pin in that in my brain because I want I want to circle back to that but I really want to understand you you th you put in this like throwaway comment of of course through this these studies and volunteering you discovered the importance of set and setting and so started using music how did you discover that how was that something that came to light through this process well, I'm not sure I discovered it. The The researchers uh, working with LSD in Canada, in Saskatchewan, were using supportive set and setting way back in the 1950s. Yeah. Duncan Blewett and uh, that crowd. Uh, and then uh, in the days of Harvard and Timothy Leary and all, uh, they were using music and holding people's hands and providing some support. Right. Uh, but in Germany, they hadn't heard of that stuff yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems, I had no idea this was in Germany. That's possibly a flaw in my research, but I was like, it seems like not the country that this would be happening in, but I'm delighted no. that it was. <laughs> uh, no. um, and then my career evolved uh, in studies of... Uh, psychology of religion and comparative religion and finally into clinical psychology. Uh, 
and um, I'm still hard at work. Right. Well, and take us through the, a little bit of the journey. So we're in like the early 60s, 63, and this is sort of something that's interesting to you. You're volunteering. There's, there's a lot that's happening. But how, what happens then for you in terms of as we get to the time when everything starts to become prohibited? Like what, what, what is your journey through this? Well, uh, I had that year in Germany uh, working in the clinic and had several additional sessions. Uh, it, it's hard to believe, but uh, at that time, there was nothing controversial about psychedelics. Mm. They were fully legal. It was perfectly reasonable to give it to a graduate student if he wrote right. a good report, you know? Mm. Yeah. They're, they're non-addictive. Um, what's the big deal? You know, mm. interesting substance. Take this uh, and write a report and let's see what you discover, you mm. know? Yeah. And that's baffling to me. I mean, we mentioned my age earlier, and like being in my generation, all I've ever known until incredibly recently is this stuff is basically drugs. Don't touch it. It's bad. This uh, is going to have negative consequences. So like this is so interesting for me to speak to to someone for whom this was before there was any suggestion that there was anything vaguely problematic about these things. So anyway, to briefly give you the outline here, mm. um, I came back to the United States and completed a Master of Divinity degree at Yale and then a degree in Psychology of Religion at Andover Newton Theological School mm -hmm. with Walter Houston Clark and got to know uh, Houston Smith, a wonderful uh, scholar of comparative religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to... Uh, Spend a year at Brandeis as a research assistant for Abraham Maslow, who was one of these people who didn't need psychedelics. He just had these profound experiences spontaneously. Okay. But uh, uh, I knew where he was coming from, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. And um, then I was offered a job uh, with LSD research in Baltimore. Mm. And uh, we had two grants then from the National Institutes of Health mm -hmm. in treatment of alcoholism and treatment mm -hmm. of uh, severe depression. And, yeah. uh, and so my wife, who was a psychiatric nurse, uh, and I moved to Baltimore. And uh, that was 1967. Right. And then I worked for 10 years at uh, Spring Grove or the Maryland, which became the Maryland Psychiatric mm -hmm. Research Center. Mm -hmm. We did all kinds of projects with mm -hmm. LSD and DPT and psilocybin and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, the great freeze happened. And I have, as I say, this dubious distinction of being the last person to legally uh, give a drug in 1977 to a cancer patient, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there were 22 years of dormancy, other than Rick Strassman's work with DMT and at yeah. University of New Mexico mm -hmm. in the early 1990s. Mm. And then in 1999, Roland Griffith and I were able to uh, restart psychedelic research at Johns Hopkins, yes, which is going strong now. Uh, mm. What is it, 23 years later with a staff of 50 uh, millions of dollars of funding? Yeah. Uh, and we have a center of psychedelic and consciousness studies. Mm -hmm. And in the past year, I focused my attention at sunstone therapies, which has just come into being in Rockville, Maryland, mm -hmm. which is also a research operation but in a busy oncology center instead of a university mm -hmm. and, and there are focuses on uh, palliative care and helping cancer patients live fully until they die with the help of psilocybin yeah mm -hmm. so I... what i'll be when i grow up yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who knows where it's going? I mean, I I feel like there's so much I want to explore about this, and and really, as someone who's been in the field for as long as the field existed, even when the field didn't exist, I'm really intrigued as to how you experienced that big freeze. What was your orientation to it? Were you 
at all confused? What was the what was the feeling within the people who were like, but this is powerful, we know the benefits. What was the underlying feeling during all those times, those years, when it wasn't really permitted? Well, you know, I had this wonderful opportunity to give psychedelics to an incredible variety of people, you know, mm. all ages, all races, all religions, all, you know, different occupations, mm. different states of physical health, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just incredibly meaningful uh, yeah. uh, learning opportunity to see how people responded to um, the opportunities that a dose of a psychedelic provide. Mm. It's not just a drug response, as I think you know. But it's the drug gives an opportunity, like it unlocks a door or several doors. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many different strata, the levels of consciousness within us. Mm -hmm. So some people primarily in a first session may work with psychodynamic material from their personal lives, you know, relationships and unresolved grief and guilt and uh, resolving traumas. And that's incredible. That's the stuff that ordinary psychotherapy is made of. And it's yeah. incredibly helpful. And uh, the psychedelic can really accelerate the yes. process of moving through if it's administered in a wise context with mm-hmm. teaching and preparation and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's but then there are the states of consciousness. Yeah that uh, you can call them transcendental or spiritual or religious or of visionary material, uh, visions of gods and goddesses and precious stones and ancient civilization. Mm -hmm. Who knows where those things come from, you Mm -hmm. know? But people reliably discover them, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, what uh, we now call mystical consciousness Mm -hmm. Uh, which, believe it or not, has become a scientific term. (laughs) I think (laughs) you can find it in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. Mm -hmm. But it's this unitive state, this uh, awareness of eternity, if you Mm -hmm. will, Mm -hmm. or infinity permeated by love. Mm -hmm. And uh, it feels more real than the state of consciousness we're in right now. Right. Or fundamental. And it's yeah. people call, describe it as waking up or mm-hmm. homecoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's what in the Buddhist tradition is called enlightenment, you know. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't instantly transform you into a saint for sure, you know. <laughs> but but it it enables you to, afterwards to remember that there is such a state of awareness within us. Yeah. And it changes the way people view themselves, others, and the world. Yeah. Yeah. uh, One of my heroes in graduate school was Carl Jaspers, a psychiatrist philosopher in Mm -hmm. Germany. And he always says, uh, man, we would say humankind now, you know, but in his era was man is more than he knows or ever can know of himself. Mm -hmm. That there really is an incredible mystery within each of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get right down to it, we still don't know what consciousness is, you know? Right. And I I find it so interesting that you're you're dovetailing the kind of divinity element with your studies in, in religion and all of those things with this psychedelic element, because to hear you describe the capacity for something like psilocybin to allow for a closer experience of God is is something that you hear and something yeah, that you kind of understand. Well, you, you know, that three-letter word God right. means a lot of different things to different people, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. For some people, it means uh, uncomfortable pews and long, boring sermons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to others, it's... Uh, uh, the bliss of uh, divine union or whatever, you know, it it means many, uh, a vision of Kuan Yin Yin, or a vision of the Christ or a Mm -hmm. vision of a Greek God, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, 
it's uh, incredibly uh, uh, rich and varied. But I have learned that uh, in some ways, the ideal research volunteer is a good agnostic, you know, uh, someone who uh, isn't sure what the ultimate structure of reality is, mm -hmm. uh, doubts maybe, as I do, that it can never be adequately put into words, you yeah. know, but, mm -hmm. but they're open and curious mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. capable of trusting and exploring, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and they tend to have these really profound experiences uh, qu quite easily, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to prove that uh, the 14th Baptist Church alone has the truth and everyone else is going to hell, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you probably have trouble because that's an agenda of the everyday yeah. self that you're yes. imposing on the experience, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you're just open, curious, uh, willing to learn. Uh, mm. I'm exploring my own consciousness in a way I've never been able to do before. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, but in, you know this. Well, I think the day will come where they are. These drugs are used in education, and there are university courses, seminars with credit uh, mm -hmm. for having psychedelic experiences and exploring you know, whether it's done. Plato's philosophy or Dante's divine comedy or uh, comparative religions or, you, or quantum physics. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to learn by exploring human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like when you speak, your you're feeling that the your feeling is that the exploration of human consciousness is is fundamental to the experience of being human. That's right. And, and I think, I go so far as to say it's a basic human right hmm. to, to to explore the mystery that we are. Yeah. Why should that be illegal? Right. You know, right. You know what are we afraid of? You know. Well, and it's interesting because I, I mentioned before we started recording, I live in Austin, Texas, where it feels a little bit like the Wild West of psychedelics. It feels very unsafe and not quite done in the right way. So I'd love whilst you're here on the podcast for you to just share with me what does safe look like yeah, what, in this realm is the right way right uh, great well first um if you have a history of severe mental illness or family biologically related family members do from what we know right now it's probably not wise to take psychedelics you might have a prolonged reaction, might be getting into more trouble than you need. That doesn't mean that these drugs can't be helpful to those people, mm -hmm. but it might have to be in a in a clinic with a steady staff for a lot of hours of care. Yeah. You know, so if you're just going to try it out and you have a mental health history that's serious, um, do your meditation instead. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm. But for most people, that's not a problem. Mm. You know, maybe I would also say if you have a really acute uh, kidney problem or heart problem, uh, you, you might want to do something gentler, you know, mm. than mm. psychedelics, mm. you know. So there's that kind of medical clearance to think about. Yeah. But then if you're going to go ahead, you know, you you got to read, you got to get educated. Uh, no one should just throw the, the drug in their mouth and see what will happen. You know, <laughs> um, my image for that in my book is, is uh, downhill skiing. You know, if you just jump on a pair of skis without any instruction and start downhill, chances are you're going to crash into a tree or injure yourself. You know, yes. it, it's mm -hmm. just a stupid thing to do. You yes. know, <laughs> like, if you're going to ski, get some instruction first. Yes. And say, so if you're going to take a psychedelic, get some instruction first. Mm -hmm. The main instruction, of course, uh, there's factors like proper purity and dosage, yeah. you know, um, uh, to know what you're taking and where it came from. 
Yeah. You know, that's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. uh, that it really is psilocybin, or if you're using mushrooms, that there, there's only about 200 different species of psilocybin containing mushrooms. And yeah. who knows how they've been stored and. <laughs> Uh, if someone has added uh, grandma's favorite recipe to them or not, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so uh, you should know what you what you're taking. You yes. know, that's the advantage of the clinical research that For we sure. we know the exact dosage and the purity yeah. of the synthesized substance. Yeah. yeah. And I can tell you, the stuff made in test tubes is mighty sacred. You know. Yeah. Mm. Um. <clears throat> Mm. Uh, and so further like and so we've mentioned set and setting quite a bit right. and i feel like there's this everyone says the words what does it mean <laughs> yeah I, I i caught my train of thought again yeah. here let me take mm -hmm. you a little but beyond that the important thing is to be in a grounded trusting relationship when you take a psychedelic mm. be with someone where you there's privacy there's confidentiality you, you feel safe to explore whatever comes up, okay? Uh, you're grounded, like grounding an electric circuit. You're, mm. there's, even if you don't talk to the person the whole day, the person is there if you need that person, okay? Mm. So you don't have to worry about a knock on the door or the telephone ringing or the house catching on fire <laughs> or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and and then you need to be motivated for personal and spiritual growth, mm -hmm. and that's a big one because that often a psychedelic takes you into painful material, like unresolved grief, guilt, mm -hmm. um, conflicts, traumas, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and. If you're with someone you trust and you're willing to go in and through that suffering, mm. you arrive at the resolution of the suffering mm. and it intensifies psychotherapy. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you run away from it, you get into what people call the bad trip. Yeah. You know, panic, paranoia, confusion, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that that's a waste of good time and Good psilocybin. Good psilocybin, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there has to be this motivation to accept, to go in and through. Mm. The way we often, if, for example, uh, you see a vision of some monster, a mm. dragon, uh, boogeyman, you name it. If you reach out for the hand of your companion, and instead of running away from it, you go towards it. Mm. You essentially say, well, hello, are you ever big and scary? What the heck are you doing in my mind? Ah. Uh -huh. But I have a right to know. This is my mind, after all. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, explain yourself. Mm. <laughs> you know, so uh, instead of running away or controlling or, or talking, you almost like dive into the pupil of the eye. Mm, I love that. Okay. Mm. And when you do, you understand what it's all about. Mm. You know, mm. is it your father when he was drunk in the middle of the night? Mm. Is, is it the person who sexually attacked you? Mm. You know, is it uh, uh, a symbolic uh, representation of guilt or grief or something? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm. So when you go towards it, there's healing resolution in and through, in and through. Mm. So you have to know that before you mm -hmm. go skiing or before yes. you go second. Mm. And the other important thing is, especially if the dosage is uh, medium or high, mm. you need to turn off the intellect mm. Mm -hmm. and the language centers mm. to kind of collect experiences to think about after the drug wears off. Yeah. And if you say, stop the world, I have to figure out what's going on here. I got to label this. Yes. Th that's the defense mechanism we call intellectualization. 
Yeah. And it gets mm-hmm. in the way and it makes for all kinds of distress mm-hmm. and it prevents mm-hmm. resolution. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Another important thing is uh, if there's somatic symptoms, a touch of nausea or a tremor, instead of complaining about it and calling it an adverse reaction, you explore it, you go with it. You mm-hmm. go, imagine a little tunnel from your forehead to the muscle and going mm-hmm. inside the muscle and mm-hmm. seeing what memories come to you or whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's working with somatic symptoms yeah. instead of just running away from them or devaluing them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, if those yeah. are in place, then you're mm-hmm. ready for a session. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I this is why I feel it'd be a legal session in uh, right. an ideal an situation ideal situation in the yeah. near future. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I and I think that, that little section of this podcast is should be required listening and your book should be required reading for anyone touching any of these sort of substances because so many people, the sense that I get is they go towards them to escape. They're like, if I know this other thing over here, then my life will be better over here. And it's that's the escapist velocity, which it, I really it, struggle with. It doesn't work. It doesn't Actually, work. We, we used to give, uh, or I used to give uh, uh, LSD to narcotic addicts oh. in one of our research projects. Yeah. And then we would ask them to compare heroin and LSD. Mm-hmm. And the comparison was almost always the narcotics and alcohol and so on take you away from your problems, away from your life. Psychedelics Mm -hmm. take you right into the core of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In and through. In and through. Mm -hmm. So it's like the opposite direction. It's not an escape drug. And I love what you said about having a companion in that because a lot of the work that I do is is sort of somatic experiencing led and it's very much about humaning with people and polyvagal theory influenced and nervous system Mm co-regulation. And it's like... Sometimes you can't go in and through because you you feel alone and having that companion. I love when you said reach for their hand. It's like the if we use these tools of, of psychedelics to further enhance the human experience by humaning with it and through it, it feels like they're additive to everything as opposed to this escapist attempt. Very much so. Yeah, we humans need one another. Right. You know, right. I often think, you know, transpersonal psychology, for example. Mm-hmm. Trans, if I re- remember my Latin right from ninth grade, <laughs> <laughs> the trans means both above and across or between. Right. You know? mm-hmm. And that that belonging to the family of man, being connected dimension is very important if you want to explore the heavens. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm, mm, I love that. And I love the sense that this is, all feels like the same thing to me, connecting to the heavens, connecting your, to your fellow man. It's it's the unity. It's the oneness of, that we are all our God. And not only that, path. but you may know the, uh, the Hindu uh, um, <clears throat> concept of uh, uh, the net of Indra, the beautiful bejeweled net of Indra that is within consciousness and it connects us all sort of like this huge spider web in which we all live you know very like the mycelium yeah and you kind of discover in these transcendental dental states that you belong to the family of man that you're Mm -hmm. part of humanity Mm -hmm. and so it's the opposite of escape right it's really uh um and in treating addictions for example after an experience like that uh you you can't pretend to be alone anymore oh, yes. or worthless like you know there's beauty and wisdom within mm-hmm. your mind mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Then there's interconnectedness mm-hmm. and, and in that's, certain ways that's it feels why it's so effective Uh, or can be so effective in the treatment of addictions right and it feels very somatic to me as in you have a felt sense that this is true that is almost irrevocable once you've been to this place of influence under the the psychedelic yeah yeah. when you think the 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 mystical consciousness may be a matter of seconds or an hour at the most in a six-hour period of drug act yeah 
and yet it stays in memory mm. so you remember it the rest of your life. Mm. And that's also, that's not only true of uh, psychedelic drug experiences, it's true of spontaneous transcendental experiences. Sure. And they happen, you know, it was sensory isolation and sensory overload and creative performance and the runner's high and yeah. natural childbirth and mm -hmm. some meditative states. And sometimes they just happen in the middle of the night for no reason. <laughs> you know? But mm. when people awaken to this dimension, mm. it's a sacred spot that they treasure, even if they never describe it to anyone else yeah mm -hmm. in fact since my book came out i occasionally get letters from one letter in particular stood out of a man in northern canada who had a spontaneous mystical experience mm. uh in his early uh teens and he was mm. now 60 70 years old mm. and he had never even told his wife about it because wow. he thought it, it maybe he was going crazy or something, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but it but it was the rudder of his life. It grounded him. Right. It was incredibly meaningful, you know. Mm -hmm. But some people just don't know about those experiences, and when they happen, they have no idea what to do with them. Right. So one thing my book has done is kind of uh, normalize them. And mm -hmm. for people, you realize, oh, my gosh, yeah, I know. I experienced that once, uh, yeah. even without a psychedelic, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and, I, and I love that. I love the normalizing of human experience, even from the dark stuff all the way up to the, the kind of esoteric and seemingly mystical and inexplicable. It feels like there's giving us permission to feel how we feel is, is something that I'm really fastidious about because it feels like there's a lot of things that push us down sometimes so i love that your book is getting that sort of traction and yeah. allowing people to have their experiences you know th thinking of, of our audience here today mm. i guess i want to be sure to to stress the variety of psychedelic experiences you know not every psychedelic experience is spiritual or mystical or transcendental yeah. you know yeah. uh Especially with a low dose or a lot of resistance, there may be pretty colors and giggling and some interesting designs mm -hmm. and a little nausea, maybe, <laughs> you know, but nothing that you would call spiritual, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. that um, uh, we use this word in theogens uh, yes. for psychedelic. Yeah. Some experiences are in theogenic, but not all are. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, so there are people who have dropped acid 200 times and they've giggled and they've seen pretty colors, but they've never really gotten into personal or spiritual development in a serious mm -hmm. way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And conversely, there's people who have never taken a psychedelic who have spontaneously had these very profound states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with your experience with these different psychedelics and different elements of plant medicines and chemical medicines, what's your what's your perspective on on the use of these from the, the healing perspective or therapeutic perspective? Is it different things for different use cases? Is everything maybe applicable? It just depends on the person. What's your your professional take? OK, there, there are, you know, Three big avenues of application with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. uh, their use in medicine, mm -hmm. their use in education, and their use in religion, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. And they're all legitimate, and each is an incredible frontier. Mm -hmm. Most of my effort has gone into the medical mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. Can we treat depression? Can we help people with terminal illness mm -hmm. live more fully? Um uh, can we, etc. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, the answer is yes. You know, it's a very uh, powerful catalyst of good psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's more than just a drug effect. You know, mm -hmm. not like taking uh, um, an SSRI to get rid of your depression. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's a trigger of an experience that you remember mm -hmm. that helps you live more fully as you apply those insights to everyday living. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And that's is your whole, belief... That's a whole new concept in psychiatry. You right. Know? Yes. And is it... So what you... What I haven't shared with you about me is that I run a medical center here in Austin, Texas called Kuya, and we actually have a mental health arm where we are bringing in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and various other forms of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. I am very integrative in my approach. I am very passionate about the integration post, the education pre the thing that's a moment in time, but then the integration afterwards. And I'd love your take on what's necessary beforehand. You've mentioned some of the educational pieces, which I feel are vital, but also what's necessary afterwards. Can this just be a, a one-off experience that people can self-integrate? Or do you believe that good psychotherapy, good talk therapy, group therapy, what is it that's afterwards that might be relevant for people? Yeah, well, even with ketamine uh, and also, you know, with the what we call the major psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, uh, DMT, ayahuasca, whatever. Um, the intention going in, mm -hmm. the support you have going in, the atmosphere in the clinic, you know, mm -hmm. where you're not just coming in here to receive a drug, yeah. but you're coming in here to uh, get some insight and live your life more fully. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we respect you and we're here with you. Mm -hmm. And we will provide presence and perhaps some well-chosen music. Yeah. And uh, you will have your experience. Mm -hmm. And if you need us during the experience, we'll be here. Yeah. And then after the experience, uh, we can debrief, talk. Yeah. There may be insights you want to apply. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the old saying, it's one thing to love all mankind and quite another thing to get along with your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so you got to bring these spiritual insights back to earth, you know? Yes. <laughs> and... Uh, um, mm -hmm. So some experiences almost integrate themselves. Right. They're yeah. so powerful, so transformative. Uh, mm. I think like St. Paul on the road to Damascus didn't need another vision of the Christ. <laughs> yes. One was, one was quite enough. It wasn't <laughs> unclear. Yeah. Right. He got the message. And, and he <laughs> tampered out there and started all these new churches. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but a lot of experiences give a changed vision of what life is, values, um, being honest with yourself, mm. you know, uh, so it can make a relationship or a career better and better or worse and worse, you know, you know, but, but there's an honest, uh, who am I? What's important? What do I want to experience and stand for in this lifetime between mm -hmm. now and the time I die. Mm -hmm. It looks like I might be mortal. Most people seem to be mortal. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, here we are. Uh, the Buddhists talk about having one precious human life. Mm -hmm. you know, less than a hundred years, but it's happening. We're in the mm -hmm. middle of it. Mm -hmm. And one thing psychedelics often give is just a... Uh, a sense of appreciation, awe, mm -hmm. gratitude mm -hmm. for being alive, for mm -hmm. just being, mm -hmm. you know, that I can see beauty, I can relate to people, mm -hmm. I can uh, work towards some cause I believe in, I can create something, you know, mm -hmm. um, gives life meaning, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. versus, you know, I don't know where I came from and why I'm here and I can't wait to die, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, mm. So, uh, and you just... know, if you think of where we are in terms of mental health in the world, mm -hmm. there are many, 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 many thousands of depressed people right now. Yeah. 
And these are people who are unaware of the resources within them mm. that could help them live more fully. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. The psychedelics wisely used mm. could help many of those people mm -hmm. live more fully, be more mm. productive, mm. Uh, have better relationships with themselves and with others. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, it, you, you know, I <laughs> sometimes uh, I remind myself that the psychedelics aren't new. Right. You, know, you wouldn't be forgiven a, for thinking they were, though, right? At the moment. Yeah, it's been around since at least 500 BC. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And like mushrooms, they kind of emerge in cultures and they get suppressed. And they yeah. emerge and they get suppressed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. right now, in our world, in the early 21st century, they're emerging. Yeah. And wouldn't it be great if we're finally evolved enough, wise enough, mature enough to integrate them responsibly into society? Mm the benefit could be immense you know? yeah. amen to that yeah it's yeah. a big reason why this our center exists here it's like we want to change mental health care and we yeah. want to use all the tools available at, at our disposal but sensibly and in the right way and at the right time and for the right patient and it feels like i really hope we're mature enough in this time zone time period you and i are doing our part oh, we know? are well, and you'd be, you'd be amazed how many people there are in the professional world and the population at large who are mm. very responsibly uh, promoting yeah. psychedelic research and yeah. the wise use of them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, and speaking of doing our part, I'm really interested in your your appointment as it, it, within this palliative care facility. And I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about this application, because it feels like it's very important to you right now. And I'd love to understand how you're using psilocybin in palliative care and, and what, what you're seeing as benefits and what it really is giving patients. Oh, uh, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Of course. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, as you know, psychedelics in medicine are used in all different ways, you know, mm -hmm. depression, addiction, so on. Uh, early Alzheimer's now and all yeah. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But th their use in, in uh, with cancer patients or just people with very serious life-threatening mm -hmm. illnesses mm -hmm. is uh, really inspiring. Mm -hmm. And the extreme is that Someone goes from uh, lying in bed with the curtains drawn, preoccupied with pain. I don't want anyone to see me like this. Uh, depressed, anxious, estranged from family. Okay. And you work with that person and you give them wisely a session with psilocybin with supportive music and good human companionship. And they tumble through all kinds of emotions and insights mm -hmm. and maybe break through into some profoundly spiritual discoveries. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, that same person becomes almost a social worker in the family. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's like, uh, come on, we... You know, I, I, I do have a very serious illness. I'm going to stick around and live as fully as I can. But we got to talk about some difficult things here, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's it's almost uh, watch me and I'll show you how to die well. Mm -hmm. Because someday you're going to have to die too. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And these people come out of bed and mm -hmm. they they live. Um, we have a follow-up group in the last group. One one person was off to Europe. <laughs> Another <laughs> an other person was uh, actually in Europe uh, calling us at 1 a.m. to be part of the group, you know? That's brilliant. <laughs> that's how meaningful the uh, the group process can be yeah. with mm -hmm. these people. 
Mm. And uh, there's decreased depression, decreased anxiety, decreased mm. preoccupation with pain. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, enjoy giving away their jewelry to other to their friends, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I want you to have this, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, our dr dream, where I'm working right now at Sunstone Therapies in Rockville, Maryland, uh, you can Google it, sunstonetherapies.com or aquilinocancercenter.com. We'll put these links in the show notes, people. They will all be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this is our dream is that what we're doing at Sunstone Aquilino is really a prototype. Right. It can be replicated in oncology centers throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So we hope our future is training people to uh, use psilocybin wisely. Mm -hmm. uh, with cancer patients and others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the next step may be not only uh, giving the psychedelic to the cancer patient, but giving it to a close family member yeah. to help yeah. with grief work mm -hmm. and communication mm -hmm. uh, before the death occurs, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it starts to normalize the use of the uh, psychedelic in our culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I think it's interesting because I think with psychedelics, there's this kind of, it doesn't quite fit into normal randomized control trial applications because no. we're not really necessarily interested in the direct drug mechanistic effect. We're interested in what happens as a result. And so it becomes only in these settings where we can truly have that understanding of this is the net impact, not the precise mechanistic target of action type investigation. Right. And so I love that you're you're developing this model and this these these anec seemingly anecdotal, but eventually will be so universal anecdotal stories of people developing almost let's say new leases of life. And I don't necessarily mean that. I almost mean new relationship to death, and that is transformative right. for so many well, people. Yeah, one of the amazing things is that uh, people, cancer patients who have these transcendental states of consciousness during mm -hmm. the action of the psychedelic mm -hmm. typically claim afterwards to have lost their fear of death. Mm -hmm. And then we ask, well, what does that mean? Right. You know? mm -hmm. And it's interesting, none of them become suicidal. No. Like there's no no effort to speed up death. <laughs> but, but, but instead of fearing it, they're approaching it with kind of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, I know my own father, who uh, uh, I never got to give psychedelics to, but mm -hmm. as he was approaching death, he said, Bill, I've never died before. I hope I do it right. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's like op openness, curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a, a new adventure. And if there if consciousness really is indestructible and eternal, mm. uh, not necessarily uh, personal immortality going on in time forever, yeah. mm -hmm. but that there's something outside of time within us. Mm. You know, as physicists, they can talk about it better than we psychologists can. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, but the intuitive feeling after these experiences is basically all is well in the universe mm. uh, in religious language he's got the whole the whole wide world in his hands yeah okay? mm -hmm. all is ultimately well whether my little life continues or not mm -hmm. yeah. and i'm so thankful to have had a human experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, this is really interesting, and and I, I love that you're sharing this. I listened, and we'll we'll tag this in the show notes as well. I listened to an interview with Roland Griffiths um, recently, yes. and with his recent diagnosis and his attitude. If anyone wants a an actual demonstration of someone who clearly has that gratitude, that level of relationship to death, which is um, 
just at peace it's a peaceful fullness with that's and that's definitely something to listen to which we'll tag in the show notes it was a tim ferris episode mm. yeah we hope roland will be with us for a while yet but yes uh, he does have a very uh, serious uh, form of cancer and uh, mm. his time may well be limited mm. i have been struck that uh uh, the Roland has not been a participant in the research, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but many who have uh, seem to be not I, only happier, but living longer. It's going to be my question. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we, we've got to do some research on that because, right. you know, when someone lives longer than expected, uh, you know, the surgeon says it's due to the surgery and the chemotherapist says it's due to the chemotherapy and so mm -hmm. on but psychologically when people are caring for themselves right. and they're enjoying life and interacting with people mm -hmm. it makes sense to me that the immune system works better oh you know? of course oh yeah. I, i'm i'm a total believer in this especially yeah. from the perspective of like loneliness is a massive a factor in all-cause mortality we know that and so if something is going to create more connectedness and more ability to socialize be the social worker of the family it has to change health outcomes it can't not even in the presence of a terminal diagnosis it has to shift what we know to be true and that's what i'm excited about by all of the psychedelic research it's like we are adding something into what has been very staid medicine which will change the paradigms in which we operate because it can't not yeah i hope you know in our, our first study at, at sunstone that's just about to be published mm -hmm. um 30 cancer patients who were prepared and integrated in the combination of individual and group uh, mm -hmm. therapy and uh, four, three or four people would have their psilocybin sessions in separate rooms with individual therapists at the same time mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And then there's a follow-up for those groups. Mm. But it is amazing how these cancer patients get empowered when they discover that they can be helpful to other patients. Oh, interesting. You know? mm -hmm. uh, th that uh, it gives almost a, you know, a sense of mission. Uh, mm. While I'm still alive, I, I want to connect with my uh, clan, my friends here, mm -hmm. who are also approaching the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a sense of community that yeah. evolves mm -hmm. that's uh, really quite wonderful. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, we prioritize community here at our center. It's, it's I, You have an open invitation to come because it's a, when you mentioned, like, does it, our center doesn't feel like a clinic. It is a community gathering space. It's, and Great. it's so important. And when I write people's protocols for whatever I'm dealing with, I basically tell them to come and hang out here because <laughs> it feels uh -huh. so nourishing because being with is one of those, one, in my opinion, is one of the most healing things we can do whether that's being with the reality of a diagnosis being with other humans being with just ourselves in a moment i feel that being with is a really important element of healing and so it doesn't surprise me that community is set up around some, right. the, sunstone and all the kind of stuff that's happening right. there and the and, architecture and the attitude of the staff as a whole and if you go to our website at sunstone you can see this beautifully designed space so it, right big windows and kind of area that you walk through almost like walking through the forest you know but, but just this feeling of welcome safety yeah. uh yep. inclusion you know yes. not the the cold medical stereotype yeah. at yeah. all yeah. and that's really important mm -hmm. for people to be able to let go trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be open to uh, other states of consciousness right yeah it's it's beautiful and i love what you're doing and i love i love the breadth that's starting to happen in the kind of this realm people who are doing it at all areas from the the medical arts but looking at using these substances to to further outcomes it feels it feels like a healthy time in medicine for for want of better words yeah i'm all for it 
so what's your perspective of the future of this psychedelic research or uses or applications what would you really love to see happen in your ideal world i don't know how much i'll get to see i'm only 82 years old you know only but only <laughs> but um I see this not only changing social structures, but really changing the way we approach death. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of parallel to a few decades ago where we were all afraid of sex. Mm. <laughs> and sex has kind of gotten normalized. Right. Uh, you can value it and not be a slut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful part of being human, you know? Mm -hmm. And similarly, death is just the way life is designed. Mm. Every one of us gets to die, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and why not live fully right up to the last breath mm. instead of living in fear and denying it? Mm. Hey, you 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 look at our uh, some of our funeral homes where they have a red mm -hmm. light shining on the corpse, you know, <laughs> to try to make it look more lifelike. <laughs> <laughs> it's so silly the the denial of yeah. that, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think of uh, in uh, I was in Varanasi in uh, India. Mm -hmm. uh, watching cremations there, mm -hmm. and how 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 different how the the corpses mm -hmm. burn with the family members, the males uh, watching the cremation, mm -hmm. and then the ashes are poured into the Ganges, and the people walk away without looking back. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but but there's a looking straight at it and accepting of it. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. You, you wrap the corpse in in beautiful fabrics and sandalwood and uh, care for it, uh, but you don't disguise it. You don't pretend it's not dead. Right. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it feels like a, a a valid goal to to reshape the way we relate to death, particularly in the Western world, particularly in this yeah. kind of like sanitized society where everything needs to just we, we're in denial of so many things. So. Mm. <laughs> And just so our listeners understand, we've spoken about specific use case, psychedelic use, psilocybin use in particular, and like using it in this end of life care or using it for these specific experiences. If you don't mind sharing and feel free to say that you don't want to, but how how is your personal relationship to the use of psychedelic psilocybin in your life right now? How How is that looking? Yeah, um, clearly I, I value it. I try to make it legally and safely available to mm -hmm. all kinds of different groups of people within the research world. And I'm supportive of uh, like Theracil in Canada that is trying to normalize the use mm -hmm. with uh, uh, palliative care. Uh, there's work going on in uh, Australia, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to uh, uh, fight for legal, responsible use of psychedelics, and mm -hmm. I'm very supportive of all that. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, um, I don't feel a need to take a psychedelic, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I have a, a number of very valuable experiences in my past that are very vivid in my memory. Mm. I've been lucky to be able to receive psychedelics legally so I can talk about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I do in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Alan Watts was the one who said, uh, when you get the message, you hang up the phone. <laughs> you know? Yes. And uh, these aren't drugs you want to take every week, you know? No. Uh, the, the memory of these, some of these states are so profound mm -hmm. that one experience is all you need. Mm. And maybe some people might like to uh, have a refresher course every few years. <laughs> like, yes, just software update. An art, art museum doesn't mean you shouldn't go to another art museum someday. <laughs> you know? <Love> that. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you know, 
But that's not being addicted to drugs. No. Mm -hmm. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's exploring the incredible ver variety and intelligence mm -hmm. and wisdom of human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably the core insight that has come to me as a therapist mm -hmm. it is respect for the way I dare say every human person's mind choreographs the content of a particular psychedelic session. Mm -hmm. There's a wisdom that's manifesting there mm -hmm. about how the conflict gets resolved and healed mm -hmm. and how the discovery of new uh, sources of strength and wisdom get uncovered within. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so often patients think they're all screwed up, you know, <laughs> they're, they're just worthless and floundering. Mm -hmm. Well, when I meet that person, I know that that's the ego talking, mm -hmm. you know, the everyday mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. But I know that within the depths of that person, mm -hmm. there is wisdom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. love. Uh, incredible beauty, mm. you know? Mm. And with the tool of the psychedelic, you can help people discover that. They don't mm. have to believe it. Mm. They can discover it, you know? Mm. I love that. That is yeah. truly beautiful. Um, and I feel like that's a, a, a stunning place to start to conclude our conversation today. I have loved every second of you sharing your wisdom with me. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on that I haven't asked you that you'd like to share with our listeners today? No, we've covered a rich landscape. There's mm. always more. There's so much more. And I, I really I love, love that. I, I feel like what I want to do with this little podcast is create this kind of safe container around it almost being a, a user guide to the potential and the possibility, not just within the psychedelic use, but within oneself as one mm. experiences these psychedelic experiences. Yeah. I would reference my book. As I, I know you will. And, and I will. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's approaching its 10th translation now. Oh, wow. It's even coming out in Chinese, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 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 it's written for the lay person. It is. Mm -hmm. uh, it does, it's not a scholarly tome with a bunch of footnotes and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's uh, written simply and directly, and um, it turned out very well, if I dare say so myself. Yeah. Yes, it is. a it, It's a great read. It will be tagged in our show notes. And as well, all the things that pertain to your resources, websites, um, Netflix documentary, all the things. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your day to speak to me today. I am, as I said at the beginning, I am honored and I really feel like I love to bring wisdom from people like yourself to a greater audience. So thank you so much. Bill. Thank you, Victoria. Sometimes it is incredibly difficult to sum up the importance of the people that I interview on this podcast, and Bill Richards is no exception. I hope that you enjoyed that conversation. Do read Bill's book if you have any interest in psilocybin and psychedelic therapies. It is linked in the show notes. And check out Sunstone Therapies, also linked in the show notes. Using psilocybin in palliative care is something that I had not heard of, and I really feel like there's, there's so much mileage in these medicines and starting to use them more widely and in more appropriate ways is absolutely what's necessary for the field. If you have any interest in checking out Kuya at all, you can head to our website at kuya.life or if you're in Austin, just pop in and see us. And with that, I hope that you all have a wonderful week and I will see you again next time on the Unveil podcast. <laughs>